This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Sarah Story, the Executive Director for the Mississippi Arts Commission. Today, we're talking with Patrick O'Connor, an award-winning writer and director who recently made a film about the Mississippi State flag called Look Way, Look Way. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, thanks for having me here. So glad that you're here. So excited for everyone to learn more about that project. But let's uh, let's talk a little bit about you first. Tell us tell us about yourself, what, what you're doing, where you live. Huh. Yeah, well, I currently live in past Christiane, Mississippi. I am married to Margaret McMullen, a, uh, a Mississippi native. We were married down here about 30 years ago, and we moved back here permanently, I hope, about uh, six or seven years ago. But I'm originally from the Chicago area, and uh, I lived in Northern California for several years, and I went away to school. And uh, then I lived in Arkansas for several years when I was there getting an MFA degree at the University of Arkansas. I've lived in... um, Southern California, working in film for a while. Then the, the biggest chunk of time is Margaret and I lived in Evansville, Indiana for almost 25 years when she was teaching at the university there. Okay. So I've moved around a little bit, but we've, we've had this connection to Mississippi for a long time, and now this is where we live. That's great. And Pascashan is on the coast. It's near New Orleans. It is. Yeah, we are about an hour and 15 from New Orleans. We're between Bay St. Louis and uh, Long Beach and Gulfport. It's kind of a Mayberry on the Gulf Coast kind of place. It's very quiet most of the time. That's great. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we enjoy it. Very good. So how did you get into filmmaking? Um, Filmmaking, I think, came as an uh, an offshoot of of, um, being a writer. I've always, uh, you know, been a voracious kind of reader, and I, as an undergraduate, studied English and creative writing and uh, decided that I wanted to be a writer and went to graduate school at the University of Arkansas, which I mentioned, and it was during my time there where I was studying fiction writing because I wanted to write short stories and novels. I was invited to participate in a screenwriting fellowship that was turned out to be sponsored by Steven Spielberg and Amblin and Universal. And I ended up being one of 10 writers that they brought to Los Angeles to spend, turned out to be a little over a year, um, basically studying and writing screenplays in that program. So I was, had sort of an immersion um, into writing for film in in that, in that program. And out of that, um, I ended up having about a 10 year career as a screenwriter. I'd sold one of of the scripts I'd written during that program, Spielberg bought. And um, I spent several years working on revisions and, you know, trying to get that project uh, where it needed to be. They never made it, Um, but that led to a lot of other screenwriting projects and, after what happened was after about 10 years working in that uh, world, my wife, we were going to have a baby and my agent was not selling scripts that I was writing and the Spielberg project wasn't being made. And I figured I needed to do something. I mean, at the time I was maybe 35 years old, I needed to do something where I wasn't waiting for, you know, an agent to call and say some good news or give me some good news. So I started working in um, advertising and marketing. And that's where I sort of got into the world of producing video and shooting video and learning about how things were edited. I did a lot of work for nonprofits that were um, kind of mini documentaries in a way, like doing work for United Way and and other organizations that were looking for documentary style projects. And I, I had my own business in that world for about almost 15 years And then about, I want to say it was around seven or eight years ago, I decided to work on a documentary that became The Invisible Patients, which was the first feature length documentary I made. Um, And that sort of got me really interested in in working on documentary films where 
I could be, you know, I could sort of control what I was working on. So I, I, I look for film projects that A, I'm, you know, really curious about, but they're also the kind of things that I can, you know, shoot and make with my own resources mm-hmm. and not have to like, you know, wait for some big production company to, you know, give me a half a million bucks to make a film. I just make films that I, you know, I think that I can do with my own resources. So that's how the, the, the writing sort of turned into film, narrative film, and then that sort of turned into documentary film, which is what I'm working on mostly now. Yeah, that's so cool. So what was that process of going from like writing, writing to screenplay writing? Like how, what did you learn? What are some differences or key? The, um, th- that process was actually kind of interesting. The way they set up this program um, is we would, they would give us a script of a film, like a, a known film. And we would, you know, take it home and read it. And we'd watch the film the next morning in Spielberg screening room. So we would have this process of, of seeing how, you know, a film worked on the page as, as a written document, how scenes were structured, how dialogue was written, how action was written. And then the next day we'd see how it turned out on the, on the screen. In wow. the afternoon, we would have a workshop um, where we would talk, you know, amongst with these other writers. Um, now Spielberg himself was not involved in this step of the stage of the process at all. There were other producers that we were working with. Um, so it was a matter of, of having a real hands-on sort of mechanical approach to understanding how the, fo- how the form works. And the, the way the, the fellowship was set up is that each of the writers, and there were 10 of us, over that course of that year, we're supposed to write two screenplays mm. as part of you know our output output during that year. And Amblin and Spielberg for sponsoring the, the, the program had what they call the right of first refusal, which means they could read all those screenplays that the 10 of us had written. And if they were interested, they could they could option one of the screenplays. And that's how that happened for me is he he read one of the screenplays that I wrote and optioned it for two years and then purchased it. And that's sort of how that worked. But in terms of the difference between writing fiction and writing screenplays, it's the, the difference is really a matter of format and structure. Yeah. You know, a movie has to be a, a certain length in a way, you know, can't go on forever. And you have to have people talking and you have to write dialogue and there's sort of an accepted um, structure of how films work. So it was, it was a matter of, you know, sort of trying to learn that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Um, so for documentaries, do you write, like, how do you structure a documentary? Do you write screenplays or is it just a completely different approach? For, for me, it's a completely different approach because the projects that I, uh, I, I take on are sort of, I think the word we use is longitudinal, it's like I take on a project that I'm going to jump into and then follow to see where it goes. Mm-hmm. So it's actually, there's, in, in my process, there's not much writing involved in that case. With The Invisible Patients, there never was a script because um, there's no narration. I mean, the whole film is carried by what you see the nurse practitioner in the film and her patients do over the course of this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but for Look Away, Look Away, towards the end of shooting and, in, and during the edit, editing process, I came to the conclusion that I was going to, that the audience was going to need a narrator. And it was, it ended up being my voice. Mm-hmm. So on that project for Look Away, Look Away, I spent months and months writing a script for myself to read over the course of that 90 minute film. Um, so that project sort of turned into a script writing project as well as a, you know, shooting and editing um, experience. That makes sense. Yeah, but it just came later on rather than... Yeah, and, and I had intended not to do that at all. That, that wasn't my intention. I wanted the story to sort of like carry out, carry its, you, you know, tell itself through mm-hmm. the actions of the characters. But there's so much more involved in that, in that story around the Mississippi state flag that it just couldn't be told only with the people in the film who were talking. There was a moment when we were going through um, uh, the edit process where I watched the film, an early cut of it with some other filmmakers. And there's this gentleman up in Chicago named Gordon Quinn, who's a founder of a big um, 
documentary film production company called Kartemp went up there and he watched it at one point he said you know there's there's actual history here and I think the viewer really needs to know what the you know test needs context for the story and that's sort of the moment where I thought I'm going to have to figure out a different way to, to do this it's the film won't work if it's just the characters talking about what they think and what they believe we had to sort of get into the history yeah um, there's a lot <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot there. And, and I learned a lot of it, you know, as I went. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So how does music fit in with documentary? Like how does soundtracks or you know, like what, at what point do you start figuring that part of the film out? Uh, the, the figuring out part of it, I think happens for, for me along the way, I'm always like collecting music, thinking this might be the kind of music I'd like to hear under a particular scene, but it doesn't really happen. Um, in my case, working with the composer doesn't really happen in earnest until you've actually got something close to a really late stage rough cut or a fine cut because they start working specifically to length in various scenes. And you know, my approach to the music is finding, uh, finding sounds and in, in, in musical pieces that um, enhance the scene and, you know, try to uh, highlight or emphasize certain elements of it or to help establish a mood without dictating it. I mean, it's sort of a delicate balance. There are a lot of, a lot of times film music, especially in documentaries, that the music will like overtake the film. And, and you'll hear that the, the filmmaker's trying to tell you how to feel about something. And the balance for me is trying to make the, the music add something to it and help connect themes throughout uh, the, the film without hitting the, the viewer over the head with, okay, now feel sad or, you know, now you should be scared now. Um, so it's a delicate balance. Um, but I, I feel like the work uh, uh, Eric Phillips did on the film, you know, really sort of works well in this particular film. Yeah. Definitely. Is it, do you use the same composer for every film or do you switch it up? No, switched it up. I mean, with this, this next project I'm working on, I would love to work with Eric again, if we can. Uh, the, the first film um, that I made, uh, The Invisible Patients, I work with a composer in the Evansville, Indiana area. Um, and I tried to find a composer here in Mississippi to work with, but just could not find a good fit. Um, so I ended up working with Eric, who, who lives in, in um, Portland, Oregon. So we did the whole thing remotely. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, this was height of the pandemic. And I had planned actually to, to spend some time with them, but it was impossible. So the whole thing we did over Zoom and sending wow. new files back and forth. And it worked out well. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, I don't think it's necessary to be in the same room with the music with a composer. And I think a lot of them would prefer you weren't there, <laughs> you know, so that they can just do their work, you know. Um, but yeah. What was the pandemic like for you as a filmmaker? Did you have to pause projects or were you able to continue? Um, didn't have to pause, had, had to shift all the post-production work from sort of in-person to all virtual. We mm -hmm. were pretty far along in the edit at that point when the pandemic hit. Um, and editing also is something that, you know, I think most editors would kind of prefer the filmmaker, the director wasn't sitting next to them the whole time. Um, because they can just work better and faster that way. So a lot of that was done remotely. Um, we had we had finished shooting most of the film before the pandemic hit, but then after, you know, we'd actually had a cut of the film done around the time the pandemic started. And when the, the murder of George Floyd happened up in Minneapolis, that sort of re reset the whole sort of dynamic of the of the flag debate in Mississippi. And I did have to shoot quite a bit more during the pandemic, um, which was really difficult because it always involved wearing a mask and we talked to people. I think if you've seen the film, a couple of the interviews at the very end, the people are wearing masks. Um, so that, you know, it made things more difficult, but there was really, you know, nothing to be done about it. I mean, right. we, shot it, we shot at the Capitol um, during those last few days while the legislature was you know, sort of working out the, you know, the, the details of what bill they were going to come up with and get that flag vote. And like three days later, something like a third of the legislators had COVID. So it was, it, it was pretty rough. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was a risky, 
enterprise, but I felt like I just had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. Well, it was, I really enjoyed the film. Oh, thank it's you. Hard, it's hard to watch, but it's good. And um, it was really I, helpful. It was yeah. helpful for me to see because I moved back to Mississippi in November of 2020. And so all of that had already happened. So I didn't really know how in depth that process was of changing the flag, the history of the yeah. context. So it was very helpful. I really enjoyed getting to learn more about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I try to warn people before they see it that it is a really tough watch. Um, it just it's just the nature of the of the debate and the, and the nature of what happened and how it played out. Um, so, yeah. This is Sarah Story, the executive director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. You are listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. To have access to all Arts Hour interviews, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. You can also listen to the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Sarah Story, the Executive Director for the Mississippi Arts Commission, and today I'm talking with Patrick O'Connor, an award-winning writer and director who recently created a film about the state flag of Mississippi called Look Away, Look Away. So we'll talk a little bit more about that film now. So Patrick, do you want to give us some context for Look Away, Look Away and how how you decided to make that film? Yeah, um, part of it had to do with the timing of when um, Margaret and I moved back down here to Pass Christiane. That was the fall of 2015. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, in the summer of 2015 is when Dylan Roof murdered those folks in the church in South Carolina. And that uh, horrible event sparked this big national debate over Confederate symbols and the appropriateness of Confederate symbols in public spaces. And in, you know, all throughout that summer and into the fall, um, we were seeing Confederate flags come down in various places and in Mississippi, I was watching this sort of two-sided debate sort of bubble up all throughout the state. I'd see news reports about a rally in, in Tupelo uh, to, to keep the flag and another rally someplace else to, to get it taken down. And I just felt like there was, you know, sort of a, a fairly momentous historical thing was happening here as Mississippi was the last of the original Confederate states to still have that Confederate symbol in its, in its state flag. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like it was a really important story. I was interested in it. And um, I spent some time sort of trying to figure out a way to do it. And, you know, found some folks who were kind of the leading activists on both sides of the issue, and contacted them and explained to them what I was going to try to do in terms of following this story, you know, to to some kind of conclusion. Um, And I was able to sort of develop relationships with, you know, several of these, these folks who, you know, allowed me to, to start filming their activities and talk to them about what they were doing. Um, so that's sort of how the, the, the process started. And then how many, how long were you filming? What, like, what was the course of time? Yeah, I was just going to say that I had thought it might take a year or two. And part of that was that the, you know, the, the, the speed with which change was happening right after the Dylan Roof mur- murder and murders in, in South Carolina just made me think it was going to, you know, probably happen fa- fairly quickly here. And I wasn't sure to tell you what would happen because because the actual the activity that I was following in the beginning was more around the two sides trying to gather signatures for a, a statewide referendum. So the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the folks who wanted to keep the state flag were trying to gather signatures 
to put a question on the ballot about adding the state flag to our constitution. And the other side um, was trying to gather enough signatures to, to do a statewide referendum to take the flag down. And they have one year to do that. So I kind of thought what was gonna happen is one side was going to gather their signatures, the question we put to a ballot, and it would either be voted to keep the flag or change the flag, and, and then we would move on. But neither side was able to gather enough signatures to get it on the ballot, so that didn't work. Um, there, were, there was a, a lawsuit uh, that was being, um, that was playing out uh, during that time that could, could have changed the flag, but did not change the flag. Uh, there were all kinds of grassroots efforts to get the legislature to change the flag. And after about, uh, or, or the legislature to keep the flag, to, to put it in um, some sort of other legislation. And after about three years, it became clear that neither side was going to actually get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so three years of shooting, and then an, another year of editing, maybe a year and a half of editing. And then the George Floyd situation happened, and that added another year of shooting, and another year of editing. So the whole thing ended up taking almost six, seven years, five, six years. Wow. Yeah, a long time. That's amazing. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about the the people that you follow, the stories that you learned through through filming. Yeah, I mean, the, the first person that I talked to. Um, uh, when I was thinking of making the film is a gentleman named Greg Stewart, who at the time was the executive director of Beauvoir, which is the home of Jefferson Davis and his presidential library and a, a Confederate cemetery in Biloxi. Um, and I reached out to him and asked if he would, you know, have a meeting with me where I could sort of lay the whole thing out about what I was trying to do. And you know, we had a meeting in his office for you know, an hour, an hour and a half. And he told me about his involvement and what his side was trying to accomplish. And and when the meeting was over, this is actually kind of a funny story. I was walking back out to my car and checking my messages. And by the time I'd gotten to my car, Greg had emailed about seven or eight of his sort of other, um, I guess you could call them sort of lead leaders in the Sons of Confederate Veterans and the Heritage uh, effort, an email he CC'd me on and said, I just met with a filmmaker named Pat O'Connor. He wants to make a film about the flag fight. Um, he's not one of us, but I trust him. And if he contacts you, you know, you know, feel free to talk to him about the film. So he introduced me to a, a lot of people who ended up being part of the film over all those years. So I owe a debt to, to Greg for doing that. Um, then I also uh, met with Sharon Brown. She lives up in Jackson. She was one of the, uh, the founders of an organization called the Flag for All Mississippians. And, and then through her, I met uh, Leah Campbell, who was another activist in Ocean Springs. Um, and, you know, part, I, I guess part of that, the filmmaking story there, the part of the filmmaking process is getting to know these people and some of their life experiences and, and how they, you know, sort of end up at this stage in their life where they have these sort of strong feelings one way or another about the flag. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I got to know these people fairly well over this time. Yeah. Did, um, did they watch the film? Yes. Um, yeah. P part of my process, and I think a lot of documentary filmmakers do this, is when I get to a, like a fine cut stage where it's, we're not, we haven't locked the picture down, but it's, we think we've got the film we want. Um, I'll watch the film with each one of the main people in the film. Okay. So I, then we had to do it over Zoom for the most part, but I watched the film with uh, George Johnson and Michael Putnam. Um, and there were a few other folks. Uh, I watched it with uh, Sharon and uh, Leah. And the, the idea being that, that I want them to feel comfortable with how they are portrayed in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea being that if, if, they had, if they felt that something was unfair about them or if I had edited something that misrepresented them, they could sort of point it out to me and. And if, you know, I could change it if that was necessary. Um, so I showed the film, I want to say to about six or seven of, of the folks in the film to sort of get their buy, you know, sign off on, yeah, okay, I understand what you're doing here and you, you portrayed my part fairly. Um, so they all watched it. And then when we premiered the film at the Oxford Film Festival back in 2021, 
um, I invited all of those folks to the premiere in Oxford to watch the film together and to participate in the Q&A afterwards. And that was a uh, that was something I always in, imagined wanting to do with the film as I was editing it and making it. I wanted it to be a film that both sides could look at, watch and understand and sort of feel good about their involvement in it. Right. And also to understand what the other people in the film, where they're coming from. Um, so having all of those folks up on a stage, I mean, they, many of them hugged each other and they found things that they have in common with each other. Uh, I think they, they have a respect for each other that they maybe did not have before. Um, so, you know, that they, they've seen it and they've seen it together and they've had some time to talk to each other about the film, um, which is something I'm, I'm pretty happy about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that any of them are now best friends and hang out together much, but I think they have a much better understanding um, for the other person's perspective that's because incredible. of that, because of that process. Yeah, that's incredible because in the film, it is just like cringe worthy how <laughs> contentious yeah. both sides are because they really care and, and yeah. really yeah. believe in what they're and th that was one of the harder parts it, for a certain period of time of making the film is I got to know these folks really pretty well. I mean, I spent a lot of time with a lot of them. I mean, the, we shot over 350 hours of footage. Wow. It was a ton of footage for a 90 minute film. So yeah. there's, there's hours and hours and hours of interviews and time spent with folks that never got into the film. So my point being that I've spent a lot of time with them and I really enjoy spending time with them. Mm -hmm. and would consider them, you know, not close friends, but friends of mine. And the, yeah. the notion that they really, really did not like each other was difficult because mm -hmm. I kind of tend to want my friends to also be friends, you right. know, like most of us do. Right. Um, so it was, it was really tough going back and forth from these various, you know, places and, and groups of folks and, and knowing that they really did not like each other or have much res respect for each other's perspective on this particular issue. So having that screening and, and seeing them together and, and you know, being civil and like I said, there was, there was some actual hugging that happened between some folks was, a, uh, was encouraging. Yeah, that's really neat, wow. And so you, you had mentioned that you didn't know where the film was going when you started it, but then it ends. Tell us about where you ended the film. Um, yeah, so the, the film ends, uh, and if I'm answering your question the right way, the film, the film ends when the flag has been changed. I mean, we, we see that it's not like a, not a spoiler issue here. Most people who know the story know the flag eventually changes. Um, and, you know, so we were there to shoot the, when the flag was taken down, when the old flag was taken down, we were there to shoot the, the putting up of the new flag. And, you know, to me, that was, you know, how the, the film ends. But then there's sort of a coda at the end that explains, um, uh, actually, no, that the coda at the end is when I ask each of the main people in the film a question about how they identify themselves. Um, so, so I asked them the question if they identify themselves more as Mississippians or Americans. Um, and for me, the answers were kind of interesting. It was very, very interesting. That really threw me. I had never thought about or heard somebody ask that question before and get such strong responses. It's, I mean, some, yeah. some, some people were very much, we're Mississippians first and some people were yeah. very much, we're Americans first. So it was just- and there, Yeah, and who, who, which person from which side says what is pretty obvious, but there's one little twist at the end. But I started asking that question because after a while it became really clear to me that the, and I think I use this line in the, the voiceover towards the end of the film, it's that, you know, how you feel about that symbol is how you, is, is about how you identify yourself. Hmm. And somebody who thinks of themselves as an American first is probably not going to have, you know, super strong feelings towards a Confederate flag. Hmm. But somebody who really thinks of themselves as, as a Mississippian or a, as a Southerner as their primary identity does, that is their, that is their flag. Um, now, if I were to ask that question to say someone from Illinois, do you, do you consider yourself an Illinoisian or whatever the word would be, or an American <laughs> first? They, would, they wouldn't even know how to answer. They wouldn't even know why you're asking the question because there's nobody in Illinois really, to my, in my experience, has that connection to Illinois that's that mm -hmm. strong. 
Um, you wouldn't get that, I don't think, in Indiana. You know, it's just, it's just people just don't think of themselves that way there. That's my my sense of it. Yeah. I think I lived in California for quite a while. And I think Californians have a very strong sort of identity as a state and as mm -hmm. residents or citizens of a state. But I think it's much, much more strong here in Mississippi and in the South in general. Mm, that's really interesting. I never thought about that way because I, I can totally see that now that you're saying that. And I would say another... California like example would be Texas, like my husband yeah. from Texas. Yeah, for sure. A Texan. Yeah. <laughs> as well as some, there are some states where that just doesn't work so much. Right, right. You know? Um, and I'm not sure like if the mid if it's a Midwestern thing where people don't think about it so much. I mean, I think Montanans probably think of themselves as Montanans, maybe not first, but it's a strong part of their culture. Right. I come from I come from a place called Illinois where that's not the case. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what you've been able to do with the film since it, it aired. It aired at the Oxford Film Fest. Is that right? Yeah, we screened at the Oxford Film Festival. It's played at a couple film festivals since then. Um, we didn't have a really big festival run. I mean, it not, not as much as I had hoped, but there's you know, the, the film festival world sort of got turned upside down during the pandemic and they downsized and a lot of them canceled. And there was also this phenomenon where there was a, a, a glut of films after the pandemic, after things opened up because people had not released films in the first year of the pandemic. Oh. So you would get these responses from film festivals saying, you know, well, we had twice as many entries as we've ever had before and we have to show fewer films. So unfortunately you didn't make the cut. So I got quite a bit of that from the bigger film festivals. Um, but and the, the screenings we had have been really good. Um, we've done several community screenings um, here in town. We screened at the Natchez uh, Literary and Cinema Festival, had a good audience there and a good Q&A there. Um, the, the responses to the film in person have, you know, to, to me been surprisingly positive. I mean, people really sort of um, enjoy is maybe not the right word, but they're somehow moved in the, from the experience of watching it with an audience. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, you know, as a filmmaker, that's really the experience you want to have as, as often as possible. Um, so that's, that's been kind of the, the, the path for the film so far. We have um, probably three or four more screenings that are, you know, we're working onto a calendar uh, in the fall. Um, I think we're going to try to have one at the Overby Center in, in Missis uh, University of Mississippi. That's in the works. I'm not sure it'll happen or not. Um, and there are a few others, you know, that we're working on. This is Sarah Story, the Executive Director of the Mississippi Arts Commission. You are listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. To have access to all Arts Hour interviews, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. You can also listen to the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. What is Chalkboard Chat? It's an MPB education podcast. It's a variety show providing information and resources for teachers, students, parents, guardians, and everyday people on various topics. It's learning something new with every publication. Chalkboard Chat. Find the podcast or listen from chalkboardchat.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. Today I'm talking with Patrick O'Connor, a writer director who most recently made a film, Look Away, Look Away, about the Mississippi state flag. Thanks for being here, Patrick. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit about some of your other uh, documentary films. So tell us about The Invisible Patient. That was your first your first documentary film, right? Yeah, yeah. The Invisible Patients um, came out in um, 2018. And that is a film about a nurse practitioner who takes a position where she becomes the primary caregiver to homebound patients. And this this nurse practitioner, her name is Jessica McLeod, is a close friend of mine. And when she took this position, she would tell stories about the circumstances that many of these, these people were living in 
And it was a lot of it was kind of, uh, I don't know, shocking is the right word, but it was disturbing to understand or to, to learn that there's this sort of group of folks who can't leave their homes for one reason or another, and, and they have to get all of their services in the house. So I thought it'd be interesting to see kind of how the healthcare system worked for people who really couldn't access it in the, in the standard way. So for about a year, I followed Jessica's care of um, five different patients in Evansville. So I would go with her to these visits to these folks' houses and get, get to know them over the course of the film. Wow. So what did, um, what were some examples? Like, what did you learn about the, the system? Oh boy. That's uh, that, that it's, it's a difficult one to navigate. I mean, I think healthcare in general is, uh, sort of a fascinating, uh, world. Um, but when you sort of, you know, put the, put the patient in their home and they can't go anywhere, it, it sort of reveals a lot of other issues. And one of the most interesting parts of it was, you know, there's, usually poverty involved. Most of the families that we spent time with were on the way low end of the economic scale and just seeing how they have to struggle with uh, just sort of the, not just the healthcare issues, but just the daily struggles of life was, you know, a little bit of an eye opener. And also, you know, just sort of how some folks are treated in the healthcare world. There's, you know, there's a, a couple in the film who, and I'm not going to get all the details right because I haven't thought about it in a while, but they, well, one of them is on pain medications and she's essentially accused of selling her pain meds with, wow. you know, no, no real evidence of it, but, but they sort of track how pills are, are, are used and, and just the amount of time that she had to spend, you know, sort of straightening all that stuff out was, was hard to see. Um, but also, you know, just the, 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 compassion that, you know, Jess, the nurse practitioner in the film displays with these patients whom she's working with. One of them is a terminally ill patient, a young man who um, kind of is, is dying on, on screen, basically. We, she, we were with her and with him through this process where he goes through uh, hospice and end of life care. Um, so it's a real window into that, um, into that as well. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's very powerful. Um, so what else was, this was your first documentary. So what did you learn from kind of that first documentary film making experience? That's a good question. I, you know, top of my head, a couple of things from the, from a, just from a practical shooting perspective, it was, um, I learned a lot about how to shoot verite scenes. Um, there's a particular sort of skill set you need to do to shoot people doing their normal activities and shooting in a way that allows you to edit scenes, um, learn some tricks about audio, just production stuff. Um, but I also think I, I learned a lot about just the amount of time and patience it requires to, to, to tell stories in this, in this way where you're not dictating the action and you just have to sort of follow how a story goes. So there's a, there's a certain amount of patience involved. Um, that one I shot for about a year. That one wasn't a super long project at the time. It felt like a long time, um, but it really wasn't. Um, so, so patience is a big part of it, I think. Um, and the, 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 I'm working on a new film now um, that's also a healthcare themed film. I can talk about that a little bit if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, tell us, tell us about it. Um, about five years ago, a mutual friend introduced me to a, a woman named Amber Olson here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. She and her family live in Ocean Springs. And um, her daughter had been diagnosed with a ultra rare fatal genetic disease called multiple sulfitase deficiency, which is something I'd never heard of before. It goes by the initials MSD. And she was looking for someone to um, make a fundraising video for them. They had fairly recently gotten this diagnosis and the, the doctor pretty much told them that, you know, there was no cure for this disease and most children who get, who have the disease die by their 10th birthday. And wow. really all you can do is just make her comfortable and, you know, kind of live your life as you know, best you can. And Amber and her husband are the kind of people who are like, you know, well, we're not going to accept that. We're going to see what we can do to, you know, find a treatment or a cure. And they, were going down that path, which is when I got involved to help them make a fundraising video. So I met with Amber 
um, to talk about this video project. And as she was telling me her experience with the disease, I thought that there was actually a bigger film here. And kind of the moment that made me think that there was really something to be explored is she had in this process at this time, she had connected with a, um, a woman, I think she lives in Arizona, whose child has or had a very similar disease. It's a lysomal disease. And what these particular diseases are like different versions of the same kind of disease. And this woman had successfully raised quite a bit of money and she was deep in the process of doing research to find a cure for this particular disease. And Amber was talking to this uh, person and she told Amber that she had just purchased a herd of sheep in New Zealand because she needed a herd of sheep for large animal testing, which is part of the FDA process. And Amber's first thought was, I have to go buy some sheep. And when I heard that, I thought, this is, this is insane. Not, not, not that Amber's insane, right. but what it revealed to me is that when a family gets this sort of ultra rare disease diagnosis, they're almost entirely on their own to figure it out. Wow. There is really no phone number to call. There's no government agency for families with children with rare diseases. Almost in every single case, it's up to the parents to figure out what the research could be, fund it, look for grants, raise money, do, do the whole thing. And here was this woman who a, a perfectly capable, smart uh, person was being asked to figure out how to cure this incurable disease. Wow. And I sort of had the sense that they were, I mean, she was in a super vulnerable place and that they were just trying to navigate what to do about their daughter. Her name is Willow. And, and I thought, this is something that for, for me almost seems shameful that, you know, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and two, it was 2017 at the time that this woman, Amber was uh, having to figure it out by herself and, wow. and that's being replicated all over the world or all over the country. Their families you know, get, to get this news and, and really have nowhere to turn. So the, the film follows, and I've been shooting now with her for almost five years follows her and her family's um, efforts and, and their daily life of, you know, what it takes to try to raise money and find a cure for a disease like this. Wow. Yeah. That's, that is a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. It's, 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 um, it's, it's going to be a, an interesting film. So are you finished or you, is this still continuing? This is still, still continuing. Yeah. I mean, this is, um, you know, we could be shooting for a couple more years. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're still working on fundraising. They have been doing some incredible um, research around gene therapy. That's wow. been very, very promising, mm -hmm. but it's, it's just a really difficult thing to do. Um, especially when you're not like, um, you know, like you don't have like institutional resources. Right. Um, they have, it, it's the, the, the thing with the, with the, um, ultra rare diseases is that like the traditional industry folks have no interest in it because there's just not enough patients with something like, uh, multiple sulfatase deficiency. I think Amber told me when, when Willow was diagnosed in, in 2016 or 17, th th there were a handful of other known cases, Wow. a handful, I mean, literally, you know, maybe 10 or 12 kids who had it, if even that. So a pharmaceutical company isn't going to spend millions of dollars researching, uh, you know, a, a treatment for a drug that's only going to be used that, that infrequently. So it's, it's a, it's a constant uphill battle. And then you add, you know, FDA regulations and just the sheer, you know, amount of money it takes to do this kind of research. We're talking millions and millions of dollars. Um, so it's an ongoing process. It's, it's, um, there's really promising research. They're, they're fairly certain that the research is going to work, but they just have to get it to a point um, in terms of fundraising and getting all the sort of research ducks lined up to get into a clinical trial phase where they actually try the gene therapy treatment on a child mm. and see what happens. Um, so that's, you know, they're, they're, they're doing a big fundraising push right now to get to a point where they can fund that process and, and see for a fact that the uh, gene therapy treatment works. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So how old is Willow now? Willow, I think, uh, just turned eight. It okay. could be off by a year or so. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, she's, she, you know, her, her, her health has, has declined, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, a doctor would say fairly predictably the disease basically attacks all the, the main um, systems of your body, the nervous system, muscles, bones. Um, so when I first met Willow, she could walk. Um, and she could sort of play and play and do that kind of stuff. She's never talked. Um, but now she's on a feeding tube. She's immobile. Um, she's, you know, in a stander, uh, most of the time when she's, when she can't walk or crawl or really move much on her own. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a really tough disease. And yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that the work on the film is, is ultimately going to help them get to where they need to be in terms of awareness and fundraising. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So, have you been traveling? Have they have, do they have to travel to go to different doctors or? What yeah, you know? yeah. One of the first trips I did with them is we went to uh, North Carolina to to spend time with a, a a researcher there who's one of the leading researchers in gene therapy called Dr. Stephen Gray, and he was at the University of North Carolina at the time. He has since moved to UT Southwest in Dallas, but the first trip I made with Amber was to have a meeting with him to sort of figure out if he could take on MSD as a disease. Cause he'd already had, he's got several of these other, I think the, he would use the word programs for other rare diseases that he's trying to cure with uh, gene therapy. Um, so we spent a day up there with him, uh, filmed conversations that they were having where she was kind of explaining to, to Dr. Gray what her experience was with Willow. And he was explaining to her how gene therapy works and, and, you know, why he thought it was a promising uh, route to take. Um, spent a lot of time up in Jackson when she goes to visit her doctors up there. Um, just as you know, she, this, she's worked with a network of specialists um, around you know neuro neuro issues in, in children. Um, and we've been to uh, I've spent some time with them at UT Southwest to, to talk to those doctors about what they're trying to do. So it's not a ton of travel, but they, they travel a lot, but I can't always go with them. And right. the pandemic, the pandemic did make shooting with uh, on this film a little more difficult. That should have made it very difficult because Willow was a medically very, very vulnerable child and I couldn't risk being in their home during the height of COVID. So there was almost a one year period where I wasn't able to shoot in person with them, but I gave their oldest daughter, uh, Kylie, a camera so that she could shoot around the house so I've got probably 10 or 15 hours of footage shot by a talented teenager. Wow. That's <laughs> that, I, that I'm hoping we'll be able to work into the film at some point. That's really cool. Yeah. Amazing. yeah. I mean, so, I think a lot, I think a lot of filmmakers had to, you know, pivot somehow during the pandemic. Like if you, you when you, it just wasn't safe to shoot with people. Right. And, um, so that's, that's how we, I tried to get around that problem, but we'll see. Yeah, well, that's cool. I will I'll look forward to watching that when that's whenever it's finished. Yeah, it could take a little time. Do you have another uh, project on the horizon? No, I actually don't have anything that I'm working on now. I usually like to have a new one started. Um, like I like right now, I'm kind of starting to think about what a new film might be because the look away, look away. I mean that that film is finished in terms of filmmaking. I still spend quite a bit of time on outreach and distribution efforts, um, social media and that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm really now working mostly on the Willow documentary and starting to think about what another film might be. Um, I'm actually looking for a subject that's not gonna take five or six years to, 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 to shoot because I'm 59 years old and I'm starting to calculate that I don't, don't have forever to keep doing. So I'm, I'm looking for a subject where I kind of know what the ending is or if it's already happened. So like it would be a film that's looking back on a particular thing. Um, but I don't really have, I don't really have that yet. Great. Yeah. You have any well, ideas? Let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll be thinking. So where can people find uh, your films to watch? Um, the, the Invisible Patients was on a lot of the streaming uh, platforms for a while, but right now it's only available on Canopy. And if you are connected to a university or a school or a library, um, most of those have subscriptions to Canopy. It's like an educational dis distribution company. So it's available on Canopy. Um, 
stand by. And then um, uh, Look Away, Look Away is available on Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube. Um, and it's also going to be on Canopy for Universities in, the, in August. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org.